is almost within living memory that a large part of New Zealand was covered with bush. The Kauri areas and the great Rimu and Totara forests formed an enormous potential wealth. Enough timber of really high quality to last New Zealand for centuries. But forests would not clothe and feed a nation in those days. Trees in their thousands had to be sacrificed. Some of the wood was used to build our homesteads and our towns and cities. But mostly the bush was rolled back so that the land could be claimed for agriculture. Because wood was plentiful, we used it lavishly for every kind of purpose. And the really high-grade timbers found their way into all kinds of uses. Cowrie for sheds in the backyard. Hart Rimu for farm buildings. Choice timbers which would have been saved in other countries for furniture and veneers were used extravagantly. Why bother to conserve the wood? There was plenty more. It was a shock to most New Zealanders to find that the bush had dwindled until only pockets of it remained. Even today, we're barely able to realize that the halcyon days of plentiful native timber are over, and they're over for many years to come. Of course, given careful and scientific management, the remaining bush will regenerate. The young Totoras and Rimus will grow again to maturity, but it will take a long time, 400 years before these are mature timber trees. Now here's a striking comparison, a 10-year-old pine flanked by Rimus of the same age. If our native trees grow slowly, there are others that grow phenomenally fast in New Zealand. These pine trees regenerate with extraordinary ease too. Something like six billion seedlings have followed the Taupo fires of three or four years ago, reclothing the burnt areas. It was this vigor of growth that caused the State Forest Service and other forestry enterprises to plant mostly pine trees in their great exotic forests. They realized that the pine timber would be a lower grade wood than our native timbers. But it is, after all, the timber most commonly used throughout Europe and North America for all building purposes. Given proper treatment and handled in the correct way, this pine wood is proving itself not only satisfactory for New Zealand requirements, but versatile as well. Most of these forests have been hand-planted over the last 30 years. Here, timber is calculated on an astronomic scale. Altogether, 400 million trees are maturing in the forests of Waka, Kayangaroa, Putararu, Nelson, Hanma. Kayangara is the biggest man-made forest in the world, and its annual growth alone would build a new city the size of Dunedin every year. These forests have a dual role ahead of them. Timber, of course, the basic use of wood. And paper pulp, a coming big industry for New Zealand. Already for a number of years, the cardboard mill at Wakatani has been pioneering the use of homegrown pine wood for pulp and various plans are underway to make newsprint and other papers in New Zealand. The process consists in grinding the logs into pulp and in spreading this out into thin, continuous sheets. The wet sheets are now dried as they pass slowly through the long kilns. The Wakatani cardboards are of high quality and they augur well for the future wood pulp schemes in New Zealand. The various hard and soft wallboards so widely used in building today are made in essentially the same way. The main difference is the coarseness of the original pulp. In the Pinex factory, the wood is first mechanically chipped and the graded chips are stored in enormous vats for feeding into the pulpers. At various stages of the process, the texture of the pulp is tested. The slightest variation would affect the quality of the finished board. Chemicals are added and the pulp starts down the rollers, the wet mat packing onto felts in the same way as the paper pulp. A little water knife keeps the edges trim. At a certain stage, a trigger sets off the big traveling knife that cuts the sheets while they're still on the move. After a passage through the dryers, the boards are ready for packing. This type of board is becoming increasingly popular in New Zealand. Its light color and attractive finish make it particularly suitable for interior paneling in modern homes. Paper and wall boards, however, represent only a byproduct in the timber industry. 
The main consideration, of course, is timber for general purposes and for building. The state mill at Walker is the biggest in New Zealand. It handles 60,000 board feet a day. But even this mill will be completely dwarfed when the national pulp scheme comes into being. The sawmill for that project will be five times as big. These figures give some indication of the increasingly important place forestry is taking among the industries of New Zealand. In these modern mills, mechanical devices are used a great deal to save labour. Surprisingly few people are needed to handle the logs. This mill uses the Swedish type of gang saw, which cuts 12 planks at a time. The saws can be set for different widths according to the size of each log. Besides the saving in time and labor, use of the gang saw means that very little of the log is lost as sawdust. The saw steers its way through even curved logs with a minimum of waste. Mechanical handling of the sawn timber is important too. There's a saying in the timber trade that every time you touch timber, you push up the price. Pine wood definitely does need careful seasoning and treatment if it's to be used for building purposes. There are various processes which will impregnate it with chemicals to make it more durable. Creosoting is the cheapest and most effective treatment for making the wood more resistant to insect borer and fungus rot, but it has definite drawbacks in its color and pungent smell. It's used mostly for telegraph poles, sleepers, fence posts and weatherboarding on houses. There are other preservatives which don't affect the appearance of the wood, and some of them are proving very effective. In this case, the process takes place in a steel cylinder into which the chemicals are pumped and maintained at pressure. Treatments of this kind represent a great advance in the safe use of timber of all kinds, not pine wood alone. Now some of the uses of pine wood. They range from the very temporary, such as packing cases, to quite permanent structures. Pit crops fall into the temporary category. And so does the shoring, tunneling and casing used in big hydro construction works. These structures only have to last throughout the building operations and then they're knocked away. The same applies to the temporary decking and casing used in the construction of bridges. In contrast to these uses, there's the pontoon landing stage at Mechanics Bay. Here is a permanent use of pine wood under very exacting service conditions. But of course, by far the greatest proportion of pine timber is reserved for building purposes. And each year, more and more pine houses are going up. These houses are entirely satisfactory, provided we recognize the limitation of this type of timber. It is eminently suitable for the framing of a house. When it is correctly dried and graded, it's quite satisfactory for subfloor timber. With careful selection in addition, it's good for weatherboarding and for flooring. These, after all, are the main items in a house. But it is not suitable for joinery, such as door and window frames, and these are usually made of more workable woods. New Zealand is traditionally a wood-conscious country. Our houses will probably always be built of wood. Most of us bitterly regret the passing of the bush and the loss of the good native timbers. We have no hope of measuring up to the high timber standards we've set ourselves in the past, but there's no reason why our homes should be less attractive or durable. As our population increases and new settlements and towns spring up all over the country, we have reason to congratulate ourselves that we have such immense reserves of this useful all-purpose pine wood. Enough to meet all our general requirements for centuries to come, and enough over to build up a new and substantial export trade in timber. <laughs>